Thank you. That's a long walk across that stage. So it's a pleasure to be here in Glasgow. Thank you very much for coming on Sunday morning at 8.30, or according to my, uh, to my computer, Sunday morning at 4.30. So it's, uh, if ever I doubt whether the audience wants to listen to what I have to say, I only have to reflect on the time and the hour uh, to take comfort in that. So I really appreciate you all coming out here to listen to what I have to say. I'm going to be talking about the MOOC ecosystem. And your first thought might be, oh boy, you know, more tech talk. Uh, and there will be a little bit of that because I can't help it. But I want to take it a little off what you might think is the normal way of talking about a technology ecosystem. I was thinking about how to organize this talk yesterday and I'm thinking about you know the usual sort of tech diagrams and they spread out and they look like trees and so we have a nice tree and a fence and that is just up the road a little ways. But I was reminded of, believe it or not, Star Trek. And yes, I'm going to start with a Star Trek story. Because I don't get to do that often enough. But in Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, so you have two spaceships battling each other. And Captain Kirk's on one and Khan is on the other. Brilliantly played by Ricardo Montalban. And Captain Kirk says, He's a novice. He doesn't think in three dimensions. And so you see the Enterprise go down, and then he goes by, and the Enterprise comes up behind him and blows him up because it's science fiction. We don't think well in three dimensions. We don't think well outside the current, if you will, level where we are. And in talking about the ecosystem, I wanted to get a little bit outside of that. And so that's what I'm going to do, and then draw some lessons from that. Now I have a wee clicker here. Here we go. <laughs> he told me, don't hit the black button. You know I want to hit the black button, but I won't. Maybe later. It's just to see what happens. So Ray Eames in 1997 created a really remarkable film called Powers of Ten and many of you have probably seen it. I'm not going to play it for you although I'm tempted but it'll take like 12 percent of my speaking time and I don't want to do that but the URL is there and these slides of course will be available on my website after the talk sometime. But the idea of Powers of Ten is you start with one meter and you zoom out till you get to the entire universe and then you zoom back in until you get to a quark. And it's remarkable, first of all, in the differences between these powers of 10, but also in the similarities that you see between, say, a galaxy and an atom. It's, it's a, it's a similarity, the similarity that's been noticed before, but this film really brings it out. So I decided kind of as a tribute to Ray Eames to do the same sort of thing with MOOCs. I can't quite use powers of 10, it doesn't really work out, but I figured I'd use powers of, well, something. Uh, it starts with twos. Just as a caveat before we begin, the numbers that I'm using are mostly made up, so don't read too much into the numbers. They're just intended to give a sense of proportion or scale. So we begin with 2000, the small town, the MOOC, the thing that George Siemens and I created back in 2008, the massive open online course. We did not intend to begin a massive open online course. We intended to do an online course that would serve as an example of the principles of connectivism because we had been talking about connectivism for several years and we had come to the conclusion by 2008 that nobody understood what we were talking about and we weren't sure that we understood what we were talking about. So we decided to set up a course as a model of what we wanted to do. And this is a diagram that was drawn by a student in the course 
and it depicts the structure of the course on opening day. And what you notice is that this does not look like your typical ordinary course. Your typical ordinary course will have 10 modules and maybe five exercises per module. It'll look like, it'll be structured like, it'll act like a book or a textbook, very organized, very linear. This is not linear and, and believe me, it wasn't really very organized either. What we tried to do is set up an environment where things could be connected to other things. And what that meant was that we didn't want to use one single application like, say, Moodle. We did use Moodle. It's up in the upper left-hand side there, and you can sort of see the nice, neat structure. But we also used things like Google Groups. We used Second Life because Second Life was still popular then. Uh, we used some discussion areas, we used online synchronous forums, and we also encouraged people to use their own websites, their own blogs, Delicious, Flickr, YouTube, whatever they wanted, and the idea was that they would provide us with links or URLs to the content that they created, and we would link it all together to form this wonderful, massive, amorphous whole. And the rest, as they say, is history. We started out thinking, oh, maybe we'll get 20, 25 people in the course, and we got 2,200 people in the course. And what was interesting and surprising and unexpected was that the structure of the course easily adapted to the size of the course. What made it possible for it to be a MOOC, massive open online course, was the fact that it was distributed. So we didn't have everybody flooding into one place. We didn't have an introductory mail thread of 2,000, hello, my name is so-and-so, that nobody could ever possibly read. So that was the MOOC. That was our first MOOC. It was an interesting and enlightening experience. So we decided to do it again. We ran Connectivism, CCK, Connectivism and Connective Knowledge course, four times. Uh, we also ran, as mentioned in the introduction, Plank. I'm really sorry about that name. It stands for Personal Learning Environments, Networks, and Knowledge. Personal learning environments were a big topic and still are a big topic in my opinion. I'll be talking quite a bit more about them tomorrow at the plenary for the conference. Um, we also ran a course on change. Uh, during which we learned that 30 weeks is way too long for an open online course. Uh, we ran another course uh, with the Chronicle of Higher Education and Educause on the future of higher education. And we began to see other MOOCs, other open online courses pop up elsewhere on the internet. Uh, Inga DeWard did one on mobile learning. Jim Groom, although he fervently denies that it's a MOOC, launched a MOOC called DS106 or Digital Storytelling 106. And so we get from 2,000 to maybe 20,000 people taking MOOCs. And so you think about that now. So we have, on the one hand, the MOOC in isolation, but now the next scale, if you will, is the series of MOOCs the number of MOOCs organized around a topic, not quite big enough to be a program of study, but not quite small enough to be a course. But it's the idea that MOOCs don't stand in isolation, that there can be more than one of them, they can be linked, they can be related. In 2011, we did another jump in order of magnitude, and uh, Norvig and Thrun launched at Stanford University, a course called An Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. I've heard numbers anywhere between 150,000 and 250,000 in this course, so I picked 200,000 just because uh, it fit the theme. The Artificial Intelligence course was really interesting in a couple of ways. First of all, it really demonstrated for the first time the power of open online learning. Open online learning isn't just the MOOC, of course, but it hadn't really been demonstrated as 
an effective form of learning until the MOOC and especially until the artificial intelligence course. The key here is open. The AI course was open to whoever wanted to take it. It was open for free to whoever wanted to take it. And it turned out there was a huge demand, incredible demand, for open online courses. Now, we already knew this. MIT had launched open courseware a number of years previous and had had millions and millions of people using it. But they never gathered in one single place the way they did in the Stanford AI course. The other problem, though, or the other factor, which is a problem, is that when you have 200,000 people, and if you're doing a fairly traditional kind of course, you end up with all kinds of bottlenecks. You're compromised in the sorts of things that you can do. In our MOOC, where we had 2,200 people, and where we had a distributed structure, we had a lot of conversation, we had a lot of interaction, we had a lot of groups forming among themselves. The Stanford AI course did not look like that at all. It looked like one of those book-like structures with a series of lessons, etc. The interaction was limited. Uh, the course was presented as videos, essentially. They were broadcast to the audience of 200,000 or whatever because you can't really have a conversation with 200,000 people. And they worked through the lessons. They worked through the online assignments, they were graded mechanically by algorithms. It's a very interesting and ingenious way of approaching the education of 200,000 people, but it has limits. It shows the weakness in the traditional form as you increase the scale and scope of what you're trying to do. Well, the Stanford AI course started something, and we can jump another order of magnitude to what we'll call the early mucosphere, which is almost pretty much the present day. Um, the, that course, of course, spun off two major technologies, uh, Coursera and Udacity. Uh, it's interesting, Sebastian Thrun, who founded Udacity, in one year said, there will be only 10 universities left in the world, and this will completely revolutionize education. And almost in the same breath said, we have created bad technology. Uh, it was essentially a broadcasting system. And it was essentially a system that, although it attracted very many people, ultimately failed in its intent to deliver learning to that many people due to the dropouts uh, due to the people just simply unable to complete the course. Um, Coursera, again, looked at the idea of free, open, online learning and decided that it wanted to make money from this. It raised venture capital. Both of these raised venture capital. So they began to look at, well, if we can't charge people money for admission, how can we charge for uh, course? And they looked at credentials, they looked at uh, certificates, they landed on a verified identity. So if you paid them money, they would attest that you are, in fact, you. Uh, MIT, not to be done, created edX. Um, edX is basically a more open version of MOOC courseware, such as Udacity or Coursera. edX has been adopted by a number of universities now and is increasing in popularity. And that's the beginning. Depending on how you define massive open online learning, you could say iTunes U, which has been around for a dog's age, is open online learning. I'm not really sure. YouTube, Khan Academy, videos available for free. We have this massive resource out there in YouTube. It's not really organized in any way, but if Coursera is open online learning, then YouTube is open online learning. Other kinds of technologies, ELG, which again has been around well before Coursera or Udacity, focusing on social learning, Joomla, which is a content management system, and so on. And so it goes. We have two million people, more or less, engaged in open online learning, and the MOOCosphere has taken off. Which leads us to national MOOC strategies. 
because that's the next logical step. And, and here we go beyond the mere mechanics of what counts as a MOOC. We go beyond the technology and we begin to think about systemic national organizational structures. The very first question that comes up with respect to MOOCs at a national level is the credentialing of graduates of MOOCs. Do you give them anything? Do you give them a certificate? Do you give them a degree if they complete enough of them? A number of different initiatives have come up. In the uh, United States, the American College of Educators determined that they would recognize MOOCs, so you would get an ACE credential for completing a MOOC, and then you would take this ACE credential to a college or a university and apply to have it recognized as a transfer credit. ACE has been doing this in other forms of education for a number of years, and it seems like a logical extension for them to do it to MOOCs. But not just any MOOC, right? We need standards for the evaluation of MOOCs, criteria for the determination of whether the education is quality education or not quality education. To my knowledge, there aren't yet national standards for the assessment of the quality of a MOOC, although there are a number of initiatives related to the qualities of MOOCs. And then, of course, there is the overall pedagogy, the standard frameworks for promoting the development, the progression through, and the organization and structures of MOOCs. Taking us even further out to 200 million, I have to look at my numbers because I, otherwise I lose track, is the relationship between MOOC and culture. This is something that we had experience with at National Research Council where I work firsthand when we engaged with the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie to create a massive open online course on open educational resources. And we looked at and we studied this to determine whether the fostering of open online learning could at the same time be the fostering of a culture, the fostering of a language, the fostering of a community. OIF believed and still believes that it can and to that end engaged us to create this MOOC which we did create and delivered to an audience of several hundred people in the Francophone community. We also engaged with the Arab League Educational, Cultural and Scientific Organization who again had the same sort of idea that a MOOC could advance cultural objectives and they were very interested in the promotion of the Arab language. They have in their, uh, in their um, Arab League curricula Arab for natives and Arab for non-natives language training courses. And so the idea was if we could use the MOOCs to propagate language learning that would also help propagate the culture. The results of these efforts, I guess uh, I would say that the, these efforts are inconclusive. I wonder though, and, and I'm still not convinced that the creation of a MOOC for a specific culture is necessarily the way to go. And I say that having been implicated in a couple of programs dedicated toward this end. It seems to me, and according to the design of the MOOCs that we originally created, that cultures are better promoted by participating in MOOCs with other cultures. When we created our first MOOC, CCK08, we had the contribution of an English-speaking community, but we also had the contribution of two separate Spanish-speaking communities. Uh, I presume one from Europe, one from South America, although I didn't check closely, who created their own groups their own second life communities and then interacted with each other. And when I talked to the French community, I, I gave a presentation in, in Clare, New Brunswick, which is a Span uh, French language community, and also to the OIF. The point that I tried to make was that rather than separating languages each into their own MOOC, the language is better presented as being equal in standing with the other linguistic groups in the same MOOC. 
And this harkens to the idea that was part of connectivism and also was part of the original design of the MOOC, and that was to, instead of fostering unity, commonality of purpose, shared language, shared goals, shared worldviews, etc., that we would attempt to foster diversity, different approaches, different languages, different technologies, different peoples, different perspectives each one coming from their own particular worldview, the interactions between them creating knowledge that was more than the knowledge contained in any one perspective, any one culture. The idea here is that knowledge would emerge from this interaction of diverse perspectives and points of view. So we go beyond. We go to what? MOOC world, we'll call it MOOC world, two billion. Uh, again, that's a round number. Uh, could be six billion, could be one billion, I don't know. Um, that map there is the, uh, it's called the Atlas of Science, and you can find it at that URL. This is a really fascinating map. Each one of those is a subject area. Each dot is a subject area. They're clustered in order of relevant similarity. So the medical ones are in a little cluster. The humanities are in a little cluster. Green down there at the bottom. I can't quite read what it is, but I think it's sociology. Um, philosophy's in there somewhere. And the links between them are citations crossing from one discipline to another. And, and there are academic journal citations. If we, if we broadened it, we'd have this incredibly dense sphere. But we get a reasonably sparse sphere, sphere I hate that word, um, if we restrict it to academic citations. Now, what this diagram tells us is that there is a connected, related web of knowledge that when we look at everything that we know, everything that we study, the disciplines don't all stand apart one from the other from the other, but they're related, they're integrated. The other thing too, which I find really interesting, is that they're all kind of at the same level here. Um, you know, there was once upon a time a philosophy called logical positivism, you may have heard of it, that believed that there were some core basic sciences like logic and mathematics at the, at the very core foundation of knowledge and then you'd have physics and the hard sciences and then you'd move up to some of the softer sciences like, oh, I don't know, uh, sociology, psychology, and then getting up there really into the soft and mushy stuff, you'd have history which prom prompted a guy called Thomas Kuhn to write about the history of science, which messed everybody up. Because what level does that go at? And then way at the top, the mussy, mushy, horrible, meaningless stuff of philosophy and even worse, continental philosophy. It turns out that this structure isn't really representative of how the disciplines interact with each other. They interact with each other together more or less as equals, more or less on the same level, more or less each acting as its own domain of inquiry with its own perspective and worldview, but interacting. And again, the whole is greater than any of, these, any of the parts. So that's MOOC world. Well, I could go higher. I could go to MOOC universe and MOOC cosmos, but I only have an hour less now. So let's go back down. Right, let's come back down, we'll pull ourselves back into the realm of 200 million. We could look at things like open resource networks. And now 200 million, what is that? Is that people? I don't know. It might be people, it might be resources. I'm really lost on what unit I'm using now, but it doesn't matter. This is kind of where I am, 200,000, this is my order of magnitude. Open resource networks, by that what I mean is this proliferation of resources that is out there now. 
I talk to people a lot of the time about developing e-learning, developing online, online learning, developing open learning resources, and the big push always, it always seems to me, is we need money to create new resources. And when I look at YouTube and the Internet Archive and the rest of what's out there, my first observation is there is a lifetime's worth of learning material already out there on the Internet. Everything from, well, I've got Gulf of Mexico cold, uh, cold sweeps, um, Arctic food webs, coral reef ecology, DNA barcoding, that's what's on there. Uh, I just kind of picked that at random. But the idea is, and, and I've said this, and it's, it's a prediction, but I'll stand by it. Anything you can think of that you want to learn, if you look on the web, there is some material that will help you learn it. Sometimes even correctly. Okay, I joke. <laughs> Actually, and interestingly enough, there's usually several versions of that learning material, and you kind of have to triangulate between them to get the facts of the matter, if there are facts of the matter, which is a question that often I ask myself. The open resource network, if you will, is very loosely structured. It doesn't look like the, the really beautiful network we just saw of all the interlinked scientific publications. It's informal. It's created by amateurs. It's created by people like Salman Khan. It's created by people like me. I got into this business creating a resource called Stephen's Guide to the Logical Fallacies. And I posted that online in 1995. It remains to this day my most popular work, which surprises no one more than me. So let's move down another level. So now we come back to 20 million, the size of a nation, more or less. And now we're beginning to be a bit more structured, a bit more formal, national repositories. One of the first tasks I had at National Research Council in Canada back in 2001, which is now prehistory, was to participate in the creation of what we called EduSource, a national or pan-Canadian learning object repository. And yes, we used the, lear the word learning object back then. The idea here was to create a national resource of learning materials that were first and foremost discoverable and secondly reusable. The idea here was that we'd create this massive national library so that colleges and universities, uh, teachers and professors could do a search, find exactly the resource that they needed and plug it in like an object into a piece of computer software into their course. And they might even localize it or adapt it, but probably that would not be necessary. I wrote a paper in 2000 called Learning Objects in which I said, really, there, we don't need 20,000 ways of teaching trigonometry. We might need five or six. It's still kind of true. It's not completely true, but it's kind of true. The idea that there could be reusable content. If there weren't reusable content, education as a discipline as we know it would not be possible. So there's a sense in which reusable content is important. The national repositories though, such as EduSource and the ones in the United States and Japan, Edna in Australia and the rest of them, bogged down, in my view, in a lot of the mechanics of national resource repository production. One thing, for example, is authentication. Now, we ran into this in EduSource. What happens if you want to mix open educational resources with commercial educational resources in the same system? Well, what we were told was everything had to be authenticated. In order to access a commercial resource, you had to log in with your name, your user ID, and the credentials that gave you permission to access this resource. And since 
all the resources were in the same environment, you would need to do the same thing for open educational resources. You would need, in other words, to authenticate in order to access free and open educational resources, which to my mind made them no longer free and open. We also had mechanisms for search and retrieval and mechanisms for deposit. Deposit's fairly simple. Well, as these things go, you still have to have the right person depositing the right resource to the right place. There was a technology developed here in Britain called SWORD, which is based on a protocol called ADAM, which is very useful for this sort of thing. And, and it allows you to deposit your resource into a repository. Finding and retrieving, not so simple. There's two ways to do this. Now, of course, I exaggerate, but there's two ways to do this. One way is to create what is called a federation or a federated repository network. This is the one I'm going to criticize. A federated repository network works like this. You have one repository or one library for each institution. So let's say there were seven, which is what we had in EduSource. Then when you go to do a search, you have a search engine that sends a request to each one of those institutions. And the idea is that you're sending your search to this federation of associated research institutes. So you send your request, you authenticate, of course, because you must authenticate, and then it sends you back the results. The, there's two problems with this, in my mind. First, it's really slow. Oh, goodness, it's so slow. Because you're doing the search seven times, you're actually making an external request, running the search, bringing back the results. Second, there's no good way of sorting the results because each of the seven sets of results comes as its own package. I hated it. That's what EduSource adopted though. So sometimes I don't always get my way. The other way of doing this is through what is called aggregation. And what you do is you still have your seven repositories, but ahead of time, you pull in metadata from each repository. Resolve that metadata into a standard format, say RSS or Dublin Core or whatever, and then when you go to do a search, you do the search on that metadata. Two advantages. One, it's really fast, way faster than the federated search. And two, you're able to sort your results no matter where they came from. So if you want a result, say, uh, oh, I don't know, about bees, you can get your bees results at the top. That's what I get for trying to come up with an example on the fly. The weakness of the aggregated approach, however, is overhead, first of all, because you need to bring in all the metadata, even though you might not need all of the metadata. The second weakness is, is timeliness, when you're bringing in the metadata ahead of time, if something changes in the repository, it won't be reflected in the metadata. So you need to bring it in again and again and again. This is a process known as harvesting. It's the foundation of content syndication on the World Wide Web. It's the foundation of news readers. It's the foundation of what eventually became things like social networks, Twitter, Facebook, and the like. They use a very different technology, but basically it's the same sort of thing. They're bringing all the data from different people together and organizing it, and then they'll present it to you. Or in the case of Facebook, they'll present a selected subset plus commercial content to you. So let's bring ourselves down a little bit, down a little bit. We'll look at the individual resource provider, the college, the institution, perhaps a federal government department, a collection, a collections library, the system that produces that collection, maybe a store of learning activities, maybe a store of learning activity records. We have a bunch of things here that can work together. We can have, as we see on the left-hand side there, a learning activities collection, similar to a library, but instead of books, it would be online digital activities. Might be tasks, 
might be quizzes, might be simulations, might be videos, etc. In the center, we have the communications, communications from person to person, communications between people and institutions, people and instructors, communications allowing them to access parts of the collection. At the top, and this is becoming important these days, something we call a learning record store or LRS. Because in these systems that you interact with, maybe it's your employer, your college, your university, the army, whatever, everything is tracked. Everything you do is tracked. If you watch a video, there's a record of that. If you re-watch the video, there's another record of that. If you try a test, there's a record of that. These records are stored in a format called XAPI, or the Experience API. It's a type of data record which basically says, this person did such and such to that thing. I, I generalize, but that's basically the structure. It's a triple kind of structure. And these activity records are stored in a record store. Why do we do this? Well, we have on the far right the possibility of collecting all of this learning data, again, specific to a collection, a system, an institution, perhaps a learning management system like Desire to Learn or Blackboard, and now they're able to begin doing analysis of that learning data. Typically things like predictive analytics. You look at, you know, somebody they're not accessing any materials from the course, the prediction, they're probably not going to pass. So let's move down a little bit from this. Oh, I forgot. Student information system. So our, we'll pull ourselves even closer now. 200,000, which is kind of the number of people that might be implicated in one of these learning analytics environments. Again, it's a large company, it's a large institution, maybe a college system or network. The learning analytics provides several services or tools, typically for the instructor, atypically for the individual. One of them is what is typically called the dashboard. The dashboard is a presentation of the results of the activity records. So you can see in the dashboard, for example, how many people completed this lesson, how many people took how long in that lesson, or different ways of presenting this information. The second aspect of learning analytics is adaptation. The adaptation of the resources to the person. The simplest example of that is, I'm trying to remember the name of it, uh, I forget what it's called, but the idea is you do some learning, you do a test, if the person passes the test they can continue, if they don't pass the test you have to go back. Adaptive learning, that's what I was thinking of. So the idea is that you create this logical structure, and it's always a logical structure, a flowchart kind of structure, and you can get very complex and very detailed, uh, and indeed if you take it as far as IMS did, uh, Instructional Management Systems Consortium based in the United States, you can create something called learning design, where different people have different roles in the rollout of a course and these roles interact with each other and you move from one learning object to the next learning object to the next learning object, object according to a logic determined by the course designer. It's all very structured, it's all very organized and the adaption engine is the bit that looks at what you do and decides what you do next. And then of course there's the mechanisms for intervention where you go beyond what the computer can do for you and you actually flag the, flag the student for personal intervention. Cases, for example, is when a person is two weeks into the course and has looked at exactly zero resources. The system would flag the student and notify the teacher, this student should be contacted, they're not doing any work, they're going to fail. So. There's a lot more to learning analytics. I could do 
an entire hour on learning analytics, but they won't let me. So let's move ourselves even a little bit closer. 20,000 community of practice. Yeah, okay, again, order of magnitude kind of thing. Community of practice now, you're pulling in actually a bit tighter than these massive learning management systems, these massive institutional systems. What you guys have here at Amy is a community of practice. Uh, you know, somewhere between two and 20,000 people at this conference and overall in the organization, I say rough guess, order of magnitude kind of thing. Communities of practice are interesting because they're actually more specific than the kind of learning that might appear even in uh, a program and certainly more specific than the kind of learning that would occur at an institutional wide basis. Communities of practice are characterized by domains of inquiry. They're characterized by a common vocabulary or jargon. And I'm sure all of you guys have jargon that I don't know. Um, they're characterized by not just a worldview, but that's part of it. They're also characterized by what they believe are problems and what they believe count as answers to those problems. When Thomas Kuhn was writing about paradigms, he was capturing many of the aspects of a community of practice. The idea that learning physics, for example, is learning how to solve the problems at the end of the chapter. Now, those of you who have studied physics know that the problems at the end of the chapter do not match the text at the beginning of the chapter. They go beyond, they require you to take this intuitive leap. This is why I was not successful at physics, because I could never make that intuitive leap. But the idea is the problems are training you to think like a physicist, to be a physicist, rather than to just know physics. This kind of, of deep immersion into a subject is facilitated by the technology of a computer, uh, community of practice, online discussions, email exchanges, forums, live conferences like this, and the like. Let's move her down even further. Whoops. To, well, this. 2000. Synchronous event. I don't know how many people are here. 2,000? A bit more? 3,000? Close enough. Synchronous event. Maybe more if we count the online people. Hi, online people. See, I never forget them. The synchronous event, the thing that brings us all together, our MOOC was a synchronous event, in a sense. It had a start. It had a finish. There was stuff inside. I think of a synchronous event as kind of a temporary community, a network that we don't have to commit ourselves to, or at least not commit ourselves too much to. It allows us to posture, it allows us to put on a persona, to try out ideas, to try something new, and then go back to our everyday life, hopefully a little bit more enlightened. The synchronous event in the MOOC, in our MOOCs, was facilitated by technology that was called at the time Illuminate, later Blackboard Collaborate. We tried other technologies. Big Blue Button failed utterly with 100 people. Uh, Adobe Connect failed utterly to produce good audio. And um, WebEx was way too expensive for us because we didn't have any money. So we settled on Collaborate. It worked really well. There are, of course, many other technologies today. Dave Cornier came up with a novel solution. He would use Skype or Google Hangouts um, or live stream, and they'd have an interaction with just a few people, but then they would broadcast that, that live stream and then take interaction in separate text-based forums. Worked really well. The online event, kind of a smallish temporary community, an essential part of a MOOC or of online learning generally. Let's bring her down even further. 200, Dunbar's number. Well, okay, Dunbar's number is 150. But 200 is close enough because it fits the theme. Why do I say Dunbar's number? Well, of course, it's the number of people 
that you can happily associate with where you know who they are, they know who you are, you can have a community, you can have what I call a group. You can begin to do things like collaborate, share values, share understandings, have a common perspective or frame of reference. Once you get beyond Dunbar's number, then the mechanisms that typically work for groups or collaboration fall apart and you need to begin impersonal structural mechanisms such as hierarchies and authorities, um, you know, vision statements, things like that. People ask me often, what is the minimum number for a MOOC? The minimum number for a MOOC is Dunbar's number. Below Dunbar's number, you no longer have a MOOC, you have a community, a group, a tribe, a neighborhood, a bunch of people who all know each other, as opposed to the cooperative, communicative, interactive, diverse, distributed network that constitutes a MOOC. Let's bring ourselves even further in, closer in. 20, 20, why 20? I don't know, I needed a number and I wanted to get this concept in here. And this seemed to be where it fit because it looks like there's about 20 things up there give or take. The idea of linked data, the idea here that the pieces of data that we work with in a MOOC, in an environment, in learning general, do not stand alone. There's not one sentence, another sentence, another sentence. It's not a pile of facts. It's not even a collection of facts like Legos. It's linked. It's conceptually linked. Look at the uh, the way they do it here. You have in the upper left, you have a work, something that was created. You have an author of the work, you have the subject of the work, and an event, which might be whatever the subject was of. The work might have an expression, an instantiation of the work, a manifestation, a printing, or an edition of the work, etc. The idea here is that you have entities or objects and they're interlinked with each other. You have different types of entities or objects, but the type almost doesn't matter. You can mix in the same environment. Books, people, subjects, printings, places, events, whatever. And they're all linked together in this abstract layer, the web of linked data. In a sense, the same thing that happened in our MOOCiverse, or whatever we called it, World MOOC with the, all the journals linked together, it's the same thing that's happening at the data level, where data is linked together. And it's interesting to me because it also reflects the idea in computer technology where we're shifting from structured, organized, representational databases such as structured query language or SQL databases where all the objects are known ahead of time, all the properties are known ahead of time, to much looser and ad hoc kind of databases. They're called no SQL databases. An example is Mongo. Or taking it a step further, graph databases um, such as um, Neo4j. But let's bring it down even further because I'm running out of time and I'm running out of space. Okay. To you, to a friend, to the personal learning environment, to the world as you see it. You, not as a professor, a teacher of masses of people, but you as an individual, you as a learner. You look out and you see the ways that you're connected to the rest of the world. You to social networks, you to other people you to things like Google and Dig and Wikipedia and all the rest of it. You sitting there at the center, you the node of your network, bringing in resources, aggregating resources, organizing your data for yourself. The concept of a personal learning environment, which is based on this concept, this you and maybe a friend, is going to be the topic of my talk tomorrow, so I'm not going to linger on it. But the personal learning environment and the MOOC are part of the same ecosystem. Let's bring it down even further. So now we're at 0 0.2 interfaces, the way we interact with the world. 
There are different ways of looking at interfaces. We can think of, for example, design patterns, different kinds of ways we organize information in front of us. The typical menu at the left side, content on the right side, for example, or we have the modern web, which is depicted kind of over there with the square boxes. Thinking about patterns, thinking about the different kinds of devices. The MOOC world today is a MOOC that should work on mobile devices as well as desktop devices, but even further to um, wearable devices, uh, interactive devices like the Fitbit that monitor your behavior, and eventually devices into, you know, that are embedded in our tools and in our household objects. So bring it down even further, 0.02. The single letter, the language, the text, the tool that we use. There are many different things we could say at this level. We could talk about the meanings of words and what they connote. What's the difference between migrant and refugee, say? Uh, we could talk about different ways of expressing ourselves. We typically think of expressing ourselves in text but the internet has seen the emergence of a phenomenon known as the lol cat, which is a picture, preferably of a cat, with text on it, preferably badly written. And the idea is that you see and understand what this text says and means. And it's more than just what's on the picture and in the text, it also is meaningful depending on your cultural perspective background, the, the, phrase, the, the word T-E-H, which of course is a misspelling of the, anybody with a history on the internet knows that T-E-H is a common, popular, frequent misspelling of the, that everybody does it, nobody can avoid it, and you might as well just go with it. Further still, touch, haptics, sensation, Pictured here is the NeuroTouch simulator. It's something that we've built at National Research Council. Again, I'll talk about it tomorrow. The idea is that you can simulate neurosurgery using real uh, neurosurgery type tools. I've actually tried it. We've set it up so that the actual resistance is physically the same as the resistance of the human brain. So you can go in there and start zapping tumors and you feel the pressure. That's really important. It's important because it draws out the idea that learning, learning a subject, especially a complex, difficult subject, isn't just about learning a bunch of facts, but immersing yourself in the experience. It's a whole body kind of thing. Bring ourselves even further down. Further down, where are we? Zero, 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 two, I don't know, I made up the number. The neural network. This is what we're trying to build. When we do the neural touch, when we do the language, when we do the interactions, what we're actually building is a neural network. Connectivism is the idea that knowledge is the organization of connections in a network. Here's one of those networks. It's the one that each of us has, and interestingly, each one of us has a different neural network. Connectivism is the idea that we learn by growing this network, by shaping this network. And you can't just shape a network by throwing a bunch of facts at it. You have to be immersed in the touch, immersed in the text, immersed in the community. But let's go further. Yes, further. The synapse. The neural network is created, of course, by connecting neurons together. Except we don't really connect them together, we put them close to each other, and there's a little gap, and they send signals over that. How do these synapses form? This is, I say, the proper domain of learning theories. And if you studied the computational structure of connectionist, not connectivist, but connectionist networks, there's a whole huge rich literature on what are called learning theories. Some simple learning theories. What fires together, wires together. 
What that means is two neurons that fire at the same time and don't fire at the same time will tend to form a connection together. This is one principle by which we create neural networks, one principle by which we create, therefore, knowledge. The bit, the tiny little piece of knowledge, the tiny little bit that connects us, the thing, the signal that gets sent from one neuron to another neuron. We bring in here now some of the variables that are involved in learning theories. For example, the strength of a connection, the strength of weak ties, the degree of affinity between one person and another person, the activation value, uh, what prompts a neuron to fire or send a signal. That depends on a function. The function in a human brain is determined chemically. The function in a connectionist neural simulation is determined by an algorithm. Tweak the algorithm, you tweak the learning theory, you change how quickly or how slowly someone learns. Changing how quickly or how slowly someone learns is like changing the parameters of communication. Open networks, closed networks. Completely open is too much, completely closed is too much. Anywhere in between is determined by a function. Okay. I got three minutes, three minutes, he says two minutes. Let me draw some lessons. This is the fun part. So as we zoom in and we zoom out, we're not just moving from level to level. I know we are, but a really good presentation by Andy Polane makes it clear that as we zoom out, we increase the complexity. It's not just more of the same. A pile of rocks isn't just more rocks. It becomes a mountain, which is something totally different. These levels, each level is a network. And we zoom in or zoom out one network to another network, up and down, up and down. In this structure, there are two dogmas that we, as educationalists, tend to adhere to. We're not good at three-dimensional thinking, remember. And these two dogmas are directly drawn from Quine's two dogmas of empiricism. First, reductionism is false. You can't go from one level down to the next level. A course isn't just a bunch of competencies. An education isn't just a bunch of grades. A class isn't just a bunch of people. A program isn't just a bunch of courses. Reductionism is false. Secondly, there's no analytic synthetic distinction. One level does not represent or constitute a model of the next representation. So what's happening instead? There are two major fundamental principles for moving between levels and therefore defining and describing an educational system. Going up levels is emergence. Going down levels is recognition. Emergence is the creation of a whole based on the organization and interaction of something that's smaller. If you recognize a picture of Richard Nixon on the television, that's an emergent pattern from the individual pixels. You recognize something bigger Something bigger is created by emergence from something smaller. And it's all much messier than I've just depicted. Way messier. We don't have nice, neat levels. They blend, they merge, they interact. It's a horrible, horrible mess. But understanding that it's a horrible mess is what gets us out of trying to understand education, learning, cognition at any one of these levels and understanding that to have a good theory, a good approach, we have to be able to go up all the way up to the MOOCiverse and all the way down to the synapse. That's my time and I thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you very much, um, Stephen, for that wonderful and interesting talk. Unfortunately, we have got right to the end, and we don't have time for any questions. But you will be around, and you will be around for the, um, the uh, main conference also. So please feel free to approach Stephen and ask him for um, um, any questions, any, any further thoughts on this. And I'd just like to um, make a small presentation to you as a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, well, there's about a 10 minute break before we move into the next sessions. So, uh, thank you very much for your participation and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.